Great. <laughs> cool. Uh, my name is Jeff Kember. I am a uh, cloud solution architect for Google, and uh, I've formerly worked as a CG soup in the film industry, and uh, I speak both cloud and visual effects. So I'm going to discuss uh, some media entertainment uh, workloads with you today and happy to take any questions afterward. So I'm going to grab this mic. So these are visual effects studios, and the thing they have in common, some of them make games, some of them make films, some of them do both. Um, the interesting part about them is they all make 3D assets, and that's how they see themselves. And the relevant bit to that is that these 3D assets can be used in augmented reality, virtual reality, on your tablet, your phone. So these companies are potentially over time transitioning more into that business rather than putting pictures on the screen, uh, be it large or small. And we can support them in that. So. This is the Titus Clipper from Jupiter Ascending. Why is this here? Well, it's a one billion polygon model. It's 30 gigs on disk. Uh, it's many, many hours to render. I just wanted to give everyone a, a scope of uh, just define kind of what it is we're talking about when we're talking about visual effects rendering. You'll notice in the, in the center of the picture, there's this nice warm glow of this um, oval area. Uh, that's the dock where if you're lucky enough to have an another spaceship, you can dock it inside. So. Um, the just amount of detail we're talking about is is, is just staggering. So it, it takes a team of modelers and texture artists and uh, lighting designers to be able to create this. And the only live action part of this is our two intrepid explorers uh, here. Um, these guys are CG and they're live action with the exception of a couple of other live action guys um, shot on plate. So the Visual Effects Studios are facing a number of challenges. Um, artist cost continues to be the number one expense uh, for visual effects companies. There is a fixed bid pricing model. Um, the, the magic of time and materials and other transitionary pricing models are, 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 are topics of conversation today's day and age. But currently, you'll get a storyboard and a script, and you'll have to make a bid on that. And there'll be a timing issue associated with it, and you need to deliver the shot. So that's, that's a significant constraint. High capital expenditures uh, for on-prem compute and storage, and that often has to be made many months in advance, sometimes a year in advance. You're then fixed to that capacity. It's very challenging. You can rent. Yes, absolutely, and you can also get uh, you know, 30 to 60 day deliverables on additional machines, but it's not an on-demand situation. So rendering has a, a unique re requirement. Um, we just looked at a picture a few minutes ago of this amazing giant spaceship. Um, it's highly parallel. If you had 300 frames of that ship bursting through the rings, you could put 100 VMs up and get a render back fairly quickly. If you instead wanted to turn and make that even faster, well, you can put them on more cores, uh, 32 uh, in our situation now, and you can then tile that picture, cut it up into fours or more. And as you tile it, you can cut it up and you launch more and more VMs and you can get an image back that might take more than 10 hours to render. You can get it back in two and a half or three hours or even less if you tile it up. Simulation is another interesting workload. It is super high on the compute and on the I.O. side as well. What's interesting about it is that it's sequential in nature. So if you kick off a fluid simulation and you have water splashing into a, um, a, a rocky shore, uh, you have to run that in a sequential fashion. And then the, the goal really is to be able to run multiple versions of those and determine which ones work and which ones don't. There's a lot of magic numbers you need to play with. Then uh, a subsequent step is a meshing step. You don't actually render the, uh, the particle simulation. You just put a mesh over the surface, and then you render that mesh. So it's multi-step. There's dependencies. The last workload we're talking about is compositing. Um, what's exciting about that is it's kind of a medium compute workload. There's been a fair amount of 3D uh, capability added to a package like Nuke. Uh, it's crazy high uh, I.O. If you've gone and enabled deep rendering because you want to be able to have multiple elements that composite together without having to re-render all their dependencies, and we can talk about that later, um, deep compositing is becoming very popular. It started about four years ago. Large files on disk. They're an order of magnitude larger on disk, so there's a lot of storage to deal with. A lot of people think of uh, rendering on the cloud as being a compute issue. There's a heavy, heavy storage issue to deal with as well. Uh, I've um, been to CG Soup on shows where we've had significant rendering workloads, and in the same studio, we've had two other shows going, and one of them might be an effects heavy show. If there's a ton of water sim up against your rendering, you're in a scenario where the file I.O. for that water sim, or those water sims, if there's tens or hundreds of them running, depending on the show, will start to make your renders fall over. Your machines will go into wait states. You're not able to deliver the files fast enough. Even if you have on-prem caching going, the system may not have been designed to handle that many sims and renders happening concurrently. Those are ideal workloads to move to the cloud because we have that amazing I.O. capability and huge network bandwidth. 
So these three different uh, work cases are um, what we're profiling for most VFX work on the cloud. There's also tons of smaller jobs. There's transcodes, there's caching of data, there's fur and, and hair simulation jobs. But these are kind of three primary categories we're working with. From a business model standpoint, one of the magic things about using the cloud is you only pay for what you need. Um, we have a new storage offering that we're going to be talking about today called Nearline. Um, movies, if you look at a studio like Weta, had, you know, they had four petabytes and now they're over 10, I understand. Um, it's, a, it's a big number. Uh, if, uh, it was discussed earlier in another talk that you have four or five or more uh, vendors on a specific show. If each vendor's contribution is a couple hundred terabytes, sometimes more than 500 terabytes, that's just a huge amount of data to, to work with. And you'll find that facilities will have hundreds of terabytes sitting on disk on expensive, high-speed file systems in their facility. Those file systems are, of course, needed for the future shows. So um, when it's time to archive a show, you really need to get that show off as quickly as possible as the other shows are starting to swell. Um, we're also pointing out again that artists are st still a crazy high expensive uh, portion of the cost. Uh, GCP burst capacity allows you to lower the wall clock time. Transcoding is another business use uh, case for GCE that works really, really well. You start off with a, a very large source file. It can be a 2 or 4K master. And then you produce up to 30 different flavors of that. Uh, a company like Netflix, for instance, will want to have you know dozens of different versions of it at different bit rates, different resolutions. You want to be able to play it back on your Android device, your Nexus, your iPhone, your iPad, uh, tablets, your MacBook, Chromebook, Windows box, whatever it may be. Um, all of those different targets require different streaming sources. So transcoding is uh, a fantastic use case. Um, we partner with uh, Cube and Deadline and um, uh, other partners for queuing. And we also have uh, partnerships with PandaStream, Zencoder. Um, and in addition to that, we support the open source uh, implementation of FFmpeg. We were talking rendering workload. If you're fortunate enough to live somewhere like London and you have a data center next door, then you fall into the low latency category. And the data center ping times are less than 10 milliseconds. So that means if you chose to, you could mount them literally as an NFS mount as though they were an extension of your data center. That's, that's great. Um, not everyone is in that, that scenario. You still need to worry about um, cloud licensing. In the higher latency situation, if you're in Mumbai, you don't have a data center next door to you from us just yet. Um, you end up needing to replicate um, what you have for your on-prem in the context of having to have a file server on the cloud. So in this situation, you're going to have to create a file system. And uh, we have a really great ZFS implementation that runs on a single VM that can support 7 to 8 gig continuously and utilizes our um, super fast next gen SSD drives. You can put a, you know, 100 plus gigs in RAM, serve that up, and then have a terabyte and a half of read cache supporting it. Create your render VMs, cloud licensing, and then you can use our queuing partners or something open source or something that you wrote yourself. So the question of why Google, we have customers who have offices in multiple countries, and I'm sure most people here in this room are working with facilities that either are themselves have multiple facilities globally or working directly with companies that have that. Um, visited a customer uh, two weeks ago, and they have facilities in Europe as well as on the west coast of North America and in Asia, and they're really excited about uh, the ability to be able to load dailies from Europe and to be able to have um, VFX soups and producers uh, in the other offices around the world to be able to just randomly choose what they want to look at. And they only pay to look at those uh, dailies that they've downloaded. They're not, they're not actually having to carry the load of using their dedicated pipes between the facilities to move gigs of data back and forth each day that may or may not be looked at. And they don't have to store it on-prem. Our permanent billing is a really nice feature. Uh, you can spin up VMs um, less than a minute, and the VM is uh, responsive to SSH. And another kind of minute and a half later, you've been able to um, spin up your rendering package and start getting a picture back. At least pixels are being rendered. Um, permanent billing is nice if you wish to render something that ends up being more than an hour. 63 minutes, for instance, we'll charge you for 63 minutes beyond the 10 minute minimum, not two hours. Uh, next generation local SSD, I touched on that a moment ago. Um, we're, we're able to get um, 600,000 IOPS off, off, the, off the drive, and there's no network bandwidth required in order to be able to access that. We have huge render capacity that you don't have to reserve in advance. If you need tens of thousands of cores, we have those cores. 
And again, I just mentioned the, the VM spin up really quickly. Uh, the Zinc license server is something that is in development currently. We've had uh, many requests from customers who, who want kind of an all-encompassing uh, per minute solution. And uh, Todd's team is working diligently on, on, on producing that. Uh, Zinc was an acquisition uh, by Google uh, last year. And the exciting part about it for us is Zinc has a significant number of license agreements with uh, various vendors. And the idea will be you'll be able to get one bill from Google. So you'll be able to spin up your VM for compute OS licenses if you want to run Windows or Red Hat, which are licensed if you want to run CentOS, which isn't. Queuing licenses, you can either bring your own queuing system or you can do a per minute um, purchase on that. And then there's also your render licenses as well. So that will provide a complete end-to-end -end per minute solution for your compute needs. So just looking at render farms, from an on-prem on, on standpoint, um, People were interested in other industries to hear that the visual effects industry has a 90 to 95% utilization on their farm. They asked, well, how, how can you do that? Why, how is it so high? And you're like, well, you, you have really smart producers and soups and leads that schedule jobs um, like a week in advance out. It's, it's highly likely that you have jobs that are you know, super high priority that are the queuing systems putting at the top, and then you have kind of normal jobs that are running, and then you have kind of the slow bake jobs where artists will put a job on the farm and they're not quite sure how it's going to look, or they want to render something at much higher sampling rates, so they'll put it on slow bake, and that's that's how you have that that 90% utilization. The problem then comes: what happens when you have the compositing department that's kind of up against the wall? Well, you might these red boxes represent machines that have been sequestered from the rendering task and have been added to the compositing task, and they are either not going to pick up any renders, as renders can take hour, you know, less than an hour for elements and many hours for, for hero frames. If you uh, want to guarantee the comp department doesn't wait and the compositing department really is only happy when they get their entire shot back, you're going to pull some of these machines off. So for simulation, as we discussed earlier, now the orange boxes rep represent a couple of artists have uh, cloth or fluid simulations or, or they're doing dragon fire, for instance. Those simulations, they can run them one at a time on their local box, but the box doesn't really do anything else while it's running the sim, so you want to be able to offload that to the cloud. So from a scalability standpoint, you now add a little more comp and you added more sim. So you're, each artist now is running two simulations instead of one, and they're meshing and pulling the resultant dependencies off. So really, what has this done to your, your on-prem rendering capacity? I mean, nothing, nothing good. Um, this is kind of a daytime mode where you have interactive artists are driving the rendering need on the farm. At night, you can go back to pretty much in a complete uh, render mode. So how does Google help with this? Well, we have a lot of compute. So the opportunity to say, I want to run as a simulation artist, I'd like to run eight versions of that water simulation. And I'm going to look at the output from that and decide which ones I want to keep. And you can kill them right away. And because the VMs spin up and spin down so quickly, an artist can work on eight machines for 15 minutes and then kill off six of them and have two run for the next two hours and go, I like number seven. It was the best. Kill the rest of them and just run number seven for the rest of the day. And then when it's finished, the queuing system shuts that VM off. And it's super efficient. And the artist only has to pay for what it is they're using. Um, from disrupting the business model, people are concerned when I suggest, well, give the artist a budget. You know, how are we going to afford this cloud thing? And like, well, we can't just, artists will run wild and, you know, they'll use all the resources that we give them. And it's like, well, right, but if you flip it around and look at it, right now artists already have currency and the currency is number of days for the shot. Artists are told the shots are bid and this, this water sim is going to take four days to do, to complete, and it's Monday. So if Thursday rolls around and the artist isn't final the shot, obviously there were check-ins by production on Monday afternoon, Tuesday, Wednesday morning, Wednesday afternoon, kind of a nervous check-in. How are we looking? You're looking at output as you go. Uh, the artist, that's their currency is time. The other art resource they've been given is the currency of their local machine and whatever farm resources they're using. So this is the same type of resource. You're just attaching a dollar figure to it. If you start putting a dollar figure on your on-prem and say, it costs me this much to have this many machines on-prem and they take this much power, this much network, I have to have a team of people to run them, and my, my render capacity that I'm not able to utilize because I have simulations running, when you look at all that balancing and put a dollar value on it, that same dollar value can be attached to what the artist is running in the cloud. If you give them a budget, and I have on previous shows, it's very effective. The artists work within that. They're smart about it in the context they want to get their shot done on Thursday as well. So we have these lovely 32 core VMs. Um, this is a, 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 a fun quote from an artist. Um, they had on-prem only, and we were able to get them on the beta for the 32 cores. And they were really pleased with how it worked out. 
they were able to take on an additional show that they um, didn't have the on the on-site capacity to be able to handle. So the uh, the excitement for us with 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 32 cores is you can choose a kind of a low mem with roughly 32 uh, roughly 30 gigs or so, and then there's a normal mem of about 100 gigs, and the high mem's a, a 200 gig option. Um, many of the software packages are licensed on a per node basis. So one of the things you do with an on-prem farm, and I've had on-prem farms that have as many as 64 cores in a single box, you'll say, great, well, I'm allowed to run you know, as many Houdini licenses as I want on that node. So you kind of look at the box and go, well, how do we increase the I.O. on the box? Well, we'll put a, a 10 gig optical NIC in it. Great. And you increase the network and you then bottleneck SSDs. So you put four SSDs in it and you start you know, getting the box as souped up as it possibly can be. And that can be, you know, the machine that can really crank through the nuke or, or HBATCH jobs for Houdini. Um, that same idea can be employed here depending on how the license model is set up. Um, for people who need to do significant rendering operations, this is a really great option. Nearline storage. This is something we're really excited about. Um, this is an archival product, but it's not really archival. It is a really inexpensive nearline solution. So I mentioned earlier that there were 400 terabyte shows lurking on everyone's machines, and they need to get them somewhere. One of the problems of going to tape is the fact that you not just go, you don't just go to tape, you go to tape twice. So you back it up and back it up again, and now you're tied into the OS and the tape robot that you used to make it and the team that was responsible for doing the backup. The really magical thing about this Nearline solution is the response time is like a couple of seconds, and that's really fast. It's not quite quick enough to be doing renders from, obviously, and there's it's not priced that way. Um, the goal, though, is for you to be able to pull back data from it really quickly. Uh, I, I don't have enough fingers and toes for the number of times I've been asked to bring an asset back from the dead, and it's three shows ago, and you don't know what version of what to restore, and you bring back just to be safe, an entire shot tree. So you bring back the whole character, and it's it's you know 20 gigs in size, and you didn't get the right thing because it was version one and not version seven, and you have to do it again, and it took three days. Individual artists can bring this back in literally seconds. And another really nice advantage of having a nearline solution is once you put the 400 terabytes to tape, it's it's there. There's no way you're going to bring that 400 terabytes back and start sifting through it and paring it down. It's, it's, it's already archived. It's, it's done. If you put 400 terabytes into Nearline, you can go through and have a really smart pipe technical assistant or someone else in that role go through and start pulling out the files you don't need. I mean, obviously, before you do the backup at all, you're not going to upload your temporary files and easily machine recreatable files. But if you don't need 17 copies of a, of a character and you know which ones you can kill, you may need to traipse through shotgun and figure out a little bit. But um, I, I had a really talented pipe TA spend three days, and they took a 325 terabyte show down to about 180 terabytes of just three days of, OK, I'm going to hit the easy stuff first, then move to the other stuff, and then kind of get, get through and only really keep the relevant bits uh, that were required. And they didn't need to keep all of the ancillary data. So the ability to shrink your archive payload down is really nice. There we go. I'd um, like to open this up for any questions. If anyone uh, would like to ask, I'd be happy to answer. I say hopefully, looking for hands to raise in the back. <laughs> cool. OK, thank you so much.